And I don't really know why they have these, except that somebody gave them a little trove. Unfortunately, um, there really aren't, at least not that I've been able to locate, any business records for Montrose. Um, but we do know that he acted as kind of a distributor uh, for Poor's work um, to other dealers, including Edith Halpert of the Downtown Gallery. And this is her ledger shown here, showing uh, Barnum Poor, as he sometimes went by in the early days, and Montrose. Um, Halpert um, represented Stuart Davis, Hunt Diedrich, and also Carl Walters. And this is a bit later piece by Carl Walters. Um, but interestingly, this is a um, Carl Walters' wife saved everything. So it's been a great, great help to like have his, his papers to look at. Um, but here is a wonderful letterhead that I found, Bill had, from uh, the Potter Shop on Madison Avenue, which I just love that little woodcut at the top. And, and these two really exhibited quite a bit. I mean, Walters really is his closest contemporary at this time. And although Poor's pottery was collected from the beginning by major museums, the Met, as we've seen, uh, Detroit Institute of Arts, and the Art Institute of Chicago, these works don't fully sh show the array of subjects that were snapped up by collectors. Landscapes, still lives, and garden plants, and we have a little bleeding heart. And this wonderful landscape is actually in the um, Art Institute of Chicago. Um, mythological figures, as the one we've seen, bathers, and here's another one that I'm quite fond of, and house pets, as we see, we've seen, and then the occasional um, religious scene. And here's a 1931 image of um, Jacob wrestling with the angel. These were all part of the mix. Um, but Poor's early use of bold line and fovis color, and you can see this, you know, really just this almost split face, as Martin Eidelberg pointed out to me, um, almost like Matisse with the red and the green. And yes, that bright yellow, and it really is, he does use a very bright yellow, is indeed from uranium. Um, this style really gives way to this more nuanced and often muted, muted tones enclosed by delicate scraffito. It's in this portrait plate of poor son. And this yellow particularly. Um, his exuberant abstract figures like this bather that we're all familiar with now, I think, give way to these quieter compositions of the 30s that emphasize his skills as a draftsman. And I think on this one you can see better than the previous slide how the lines just playfully overlap, so you don't know if the pot seems to end here, but perhaps it also goes here. Is that or is it is scraffito, and it's an interesting process. Um, he does something that I've never seen anyone else do, and maybe you will know, Susan, um, of this, but he actually, um, well, he, on his green where he paints a, a dark slip, and then he fires it. And then he applies the light colored slip on the fired ware and, and scratches into it and fire, you know, and then paints and fires it again. But, but that's how you get that really wonderful, rich contrast. And you also get a little bleeding through, um, some more pronounced than others. But the clay is the same. It's really just a kind of a, a lighter red earthenware clay. So I think that's pretty unusual if anybody wants to talk to me about it after. Um, in the second half of the 1920s, Poor was also incorporating, is it, are we advancing? There. Poor was also incorporated, incorporating abstract geometric pattern to a greater degree that was thoroughly in step with art moderne or art deco style as we like to call it. His most ardent critic proclaimed it a pity that he should not have been sent to Paris to represent the American decorative art at the uh, great international exhibition of decorative arts in 1925. And in fact, no Americans went because Herbert Hoover, who was Commerce Secretary, said, Americans don't have, make modern art. There's nothing, no modern decorative art to show. 
Um, but when we see the 1924 bather here, and I do think he made this after kind of a quick visit to France in 1924, and this wonderful vase that is now on view, uh, Jardinier really, uh, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. If you haven't seen it, do go to the American Wing. You know, we have to kind of disagree. And his sense of abstraction pattern also translates beautifully, I think, to um, these kind of more rare carved relief um, things that he was doing, like this tile. Again, with a dog, it seems to be a light motif. House pets. And I guess while it should be obvious from the plates that I have shown that Poor's first impulse to make pottery was to create a surface on which to paint, I'd like to point out that his love of clay led him to create other forms too. And from the beginning, he threw a variety of ware, as we I've mentioned a few of them, cups, beakers, jugs, goblets, lidded pots, jardinieres. And in the late 20s, he's also experimenting with geometric form. As with this hourglass-shaped vase that recently came up at auction, and this star-shaped centerpiece. He used, and for many of these, he used a variety of plaster molds. Um, and he used molds not only for throwing his plates, which he did use um, plaster bats to throw his plates, shape his plates over a wheel, um, but also for draping, pressing, and I, I think also slip casting forms. But um, his slip casting seems so experimental. It's basically a one piece mold, but the piece is tubular that came out, and I guess that can work, but I've never seen that done. Not many of those in any case. Um, Poor, as many people know, gained a uh, reputation for being indifferent to technical perfection. And throughout his nearly 50 years as a potter, um, his plates and other forms defiantly bore the, the effects and pitfalls, really, of the process of their making. Stilt marks and warping are very common, even in the best works. Um, and these kinds of things really flummoxed his dealers and certainly many of his collectors. Julia Force, who many of you know was with the Whitney, um, a, returned a set of commissioned salad plates because they did not meet up to her exacting standards. Um, and for this, Poor gave um, an explanation in his book of pottery, and I quote, loving drawing and painting, I follow wholeheartedly the technique which I felt demanded least technical and scientific knowledge and gave most freedom and richness to drawing and color. From the beginning, I had an obsession against letting technique be the controlling factor. I even exhibited and sold cracked and imperfect pieces if I felt the decoration was fine enough, as you would mount a drawing if you liked it, even though the paper was torn and soiled. My sole criterion is, the, is still the life of each piece and its beauty of form and decoration not its technical perfection. This um, rather casual attitude, um, I should add, really bothers studio potters to this day. One of my first sort of Google searches when I deci decided that you know, this might be a dissertation project was uh, discovering an online discussion group called Henry Varnum Poor Made Crappy Mugs. <laughs> And, you know, they have a point. He is, he is indifferent in many cases. But keep in mind, however, that, you know, Poor didn't have many models to base his, what he was doing on, and he really wasn't trained in pottery. Um, by adopting these kinds of production methods, throwing, molding, stacking pots in the kiln, he avoided what he thought of as the preciousness of the artist Potter, and that was a term he absolutely detested. 